Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Our monthly leaders forum addresses vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plow. I'm the executive director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 National American Charitable Organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, the leading institution named in honor of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The hospital is a motto of coexistence as it serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center via our website and social media outlets on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube, and on our Facebook page and discussion group. Today's Global Connections topic is the future of U.S.-Israel relations. Thank you to our very special guest, Ambassador Martin Indyk of the Council on Foreign Relations, Lucy Kurtzer Ellenbogen of the United States Institute of Peace, and David Makovsky of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thank you, Josh. When Israelis voted in November for a new Knesset, a new parliament, it was the fifth time they voted in just three and a half years. And it was the first election to produce what appears to be a relatively stable coalition. 64 seats out of the 120 in the Knesset are led by the country's longest serving prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. But as things have turned out, the alliance of parties behind the prime minister may be the only stable aspect of Israeli political life today. Netanyahu and his allies, including religious parties and those from the far right, uh, support his effort to weaken Israel's Supreme Court. Hundreds of thousands of Israeli protesters call that a threat to Israeli democracy. Meanwhile, on the West Bank, violence between Palestinians and both Israeli forces and Jewish settlers has been so intense as to suggest that a new intifada, a new Palestinian uprising may be in the offing. All this while the prime minister remains on trial for corruption charges, a condition from which he conceivably could liberate himself uh, if uh, the new law weakening the judiciary is approved. Uh, if all this weren't enough, uh, there have been reports of Israeli high-tech firms moving money out of the country, a uh, capital flight that undermines Bibi Netanyahu's main claim to a success as having nurtured Israel as the startup nation, and uh, military reservists, some from elite units, uh, have said that they will not show up for duty uh, out of protest against uh, the bill to weaken the judiciary. Where is all this headed, and what, if anything, should the United States say or do about it? Those are difficult questions. We've asked a very excellent panel to tell us what they think. Our first panelist, David Makovsky of the Washington Institute for Near East uh, Policy, directs the Institute's project on the Mideast peace process. Uh, for years, he, he covered Israel as a journalist. Uh, he wrote for the Jerusalem Post, where he became editor-in-chief uh, for the Israeli daily Haaretz, well, he was diplomatic correspondent, also for U.S. News and World Report, and he's written for and appeared on uh, any number of other news sources and broadcasts. He's the co-author with Dennis Ross of the book Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. He's also the host of the podcast Decision Points. Uh, David Makovsky, thank you for joining us today. It's good to see you. Always, always a delight to be back with you, Robert. Okay, well, I, I want you to describe now. How do you describe what's going on in Israel right now? Look, this is extremely serious. I think it's one of the points of domestic turmoil that's one of the worst in Israel's 75 years. Of course, the Rabin assassination was a phenomenon unto itself. There were others, uh, the Lebanon War, 
but we have not seen uh, weekly demonstrations of 160,000 people, uh, 80,000 once uh, the first week in the pouring rain. Uh, we've not seen, as you said, the elite officers, you know, refusing to show up for training sessions. Uh, this is unprecedented. We're on uncharted uh, waters here. Uh, I would just say that, Robert, you know, the secret sauce of Israel for 75 years was was the social cohesiveness of its people. They might have policy disagreements uh, that and they fought them, you know, very vigorously. But this the, this cohesiveness was the national resilience of the people that they felt they were in the same boat together. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they could uh, withstand all their enemies, uh, whether they were state actors in recent decades, uh, you know, non-state actors, Iran, et cetera. Um, but that social cohesiveness was a given. You didn't feel the social fabric was being ripped. Yeah. And the, the idea that people might not have an independent judiciary was unthinkable. It's not like America, where we have a constitution, a bill of rights, term limits, uh, bicameral Congress, uh, a, a cons you know, an amendment system, three quarters of the states to, to amend the law. Uh, it is, um, you know, they, uh, the, we have a federal, a state system. We have a lot of protections. What Israel has is the Supreme Court. They have what's called a basic law. It's a, it's a constitution in the writing. It had not been finalized. It's 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 done by chapters, so to speak, because they couldn't agree on religion and state since forty eight. But the, the court has been the bulwark and um, and has been really the checks and balances for Israel that that would come under attack is so unthinkable. That's what's bringing people to the streets. And, I, and I'm very worried that that social fabric that has been so essential is, is now being ripped. And uh, we shall see how this plays out in the coming weeks. But this is yeah. high noon in Israel. It is the most dramatic domestic crisis that has nothing to do you know, with uh, you know, foreign policy, although it has implications for foreign policy, yeah. no doubt. But it is of a domestic turmoil of something I've never seen. And uh, I must say, as someone who usually likes to see the cup half full, I'm, I'm probably more worried than I've ever than I've ever been. Although there's all these talks of compromises uh, and hope that the president is the off ramp, that is the Israeli president Herzog is an off ramp for that crisis. But I'm sure we'll discuss it. The, the protests are, are, uh, are they're loud, they're passionate. Uh, the numbers are amazing. Uh, but the protests don't seem to to shake loose uh, anyone from Netanyahu's coalition in, in support of uh, of, of this uh, policy with with respect to the courts. What what is so important to members of the governing coalition about supporting this law uh, that reduces the power of the of the Supreme Court? I think what's what's key in understanding uh, kind of the backstory here is that all of the constituents of the Netanyahu government have their own distinct grievance against the court. The ultra-Orthodox don't like the court mixing in when it comes to the draft. You know, they say, if we have the political clout, why are you saying equality under the law? You know, that's a political issue. We'll solve that. Uh, and we have the clout, so stay out of that. Then the settlers say, stay out of issues like West Bank land usage, uh, and that gives Palestinians the right to petition the court and talk about uh, is there private uh, land here of the Palestinians? If we have the political clout, why is this your business? That's a second set of grievances. There's the party called the Shas, the ultra orthodox Sephardic party, and they have a leader who's who's very charismatic, and he's also happens to be a political moderate. Uh, back to the Rabin era and um, and even before. And uh, they said, well, we voted for him, 400,000 people. Isn't that enough for you? Why are you trying to disqualify him? OK, so he's had a couple of corruption convictions, but he's we voted for him. So they have their grievance. Then this you have Netanyahu with his grievance with the court where he feels that the, the, the law enforcement agencies played hardball to flip people for state's witness. So and then there's another group, the Smutrich and, and Benvir, I would say, who's been convicted many times on incitement issues. Yeah. He did, he's in love with the court. So all these five different tracks of grievances have kind of congealed into kind of a, a collective grievance of, of the constituents. And therefore, it's unclear if Bibi himself, Netanyahu himself, could end this. 
I would hope he can, this, this nightmare, I would call it. And uh, but just know that each one of the constituents has their own beef yeah. with the courts. Uh, looking, uh, turning once once again to the protesters, uh, the protesters include Jews of the political left, right, center. Uh, they don't seem to include any, any or, or very many Arab Israelis. That's true. <clears throat> it's a great observation. It's true. I mean, on one hand, I've been so <laughs> inspired by what you just said about left, center, right, people with kippot, not kippot. It's not just a Tel Aviv high-tech phenomenon. That's what gets the attention. But you've had demonstrations in virtually every city of Israel, but but uh, of Jewish Israel. But the Arabs have not, oh, have not always felt the court has been on their side, and they have kind of stayed out of it. Uh, sometimes a, a reporter will be able to get them to say certain things, but they are not a key component of this. And I think that is, to me, is like a, a fly in the ointment here that uh, that they have not been as vigorously a part of it because what the court does more than anything is it understands the nature of democracy for some is that it's majoritarian. But really the power of the courts in no small measure is that it protects minorities like the Israeli Arabs. And so it, it's very sad to me yeah. that they don't seem to see that. They see where the, the court is not ruled enough in their favor, but they should realize without the court, the majoritarian impulses here, I think, I fear would come at their expense. Um, well, just one other question, David. Uh, I, I mentioned that you've co-authored a book with Dennis Ross about uh, four Israeli leaders, Ben-Gurion, Begin, right. uh, Sharon, Rabin, uh, each, each one had some critical turning point. Yeah. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu has been prime minister longer than them. Right. Uh, is this his turning point? Uh, and is it a sharp turn to the right uh, that uh, will mark the rest of his career? I, I think it will, if this goes forward, it, 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 I fear it, it will ruin his legacy because his playbook that has worked for him to make him, as you say, Robert, the longest serving Israeli prime minister is this kind of mix. It's, it's a mix of incredible economic prosperity, Israel's GDP per capita, per capita, I'm not talking about overall GDP, but per capita, according to the World Bank, has just eclipsed Germany. It has eclipsed Britain. It has eclipsed France. It has eclipsed Japan. Uh, and that's the high tech with 15%, I think, of the workforce uh, getting over 54% of the exports uh, that are high quality exports. That's part of his legacy. The other part of his legacy is that he's, Actually, while he talks tough, he's very been risk averse. He's never sent, uh, you know, Israeli troops in, into combat on the ground, believe it or not. There was a moment when Martin and I were in government where he sent them for a mile or two into a tunnel in Gaza just to make sure they didn't dig under a kibbutz. But he understands he lost his brother in combat, Yoni and Entebbe, and he understands what one fatality does. The public likes the fact that he usually tries to take calculated risks and not reckless risks. Unfortunately, he's taken this playbook uh, where he's what I would call more representing the conservative right, and he's thrown his lot with the radical right. Mm -hmm. And I hope he veers back to where he was, but that uh, is throwing the playbook out the window. He might say he's got two two hands on, on the wheel, but someone else has gotten two feet on the accelerator and it's not clear he's in charge. And it's, I think for him, it's ruinous. And for the country, I fear it's ruinous. And I hope he pulls back uh, uh, at the last minute because I feel it will it will mar his legacy, which has been considerable given Israel's economic miracle. David Murkowski, thanks and stick around because we we'll have to stay with question you. and answer session discussion Delighted. coming up later. Uh, we're going to turn now to our next panelist, Lucy Kurtzer Ellenbogen. Uh, she works at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, she is director there of the Institute's program on Israel and the Palestinian territories. Uh, in the past, uh, she worked as an Arabic language specialist at the State Department. She's proficient in both Arabic and Hebrew. Uh, she has also worked at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government uh, on the Kennedy School's Middle East Initiative. Lucy Kurtzer, Ellen Bogan, welcome. Thanks for doing this. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. There you are. Uh, let's let's concentrate on Israeli-Palestinian relations on the West Bank, uh, where there's been some horrible violence in, in recent weeks. How bad is it and what's different about the conflict on the West Bank uh, now than before? 
Um, yes, this is, you know, David was using uh, the term unprecedented times in relation to what we're seeing uh, on, on the domestic front and in terms of domestic politics. Um, I, I, I'm not sure uh, if we're yet talking unprecedented. Of course, we've had so many large scale uh, outbreaks of violence in this conflict context before. But what we are seeing uh, now is something uh, very concerning. There are those who will say we're already in a third intifada. If we certainly look at the uh, statistics of uh, of fatalities, Palestinian and Israeli at the hands of each other, starting last year, those numbers were higher than they had been for over a couple of decades. Um, there, I think what marks this period that we're seeing, uh, particularly uh, the violence that we've been seeing uh, starting in the northern part of the West Bank, in Janine and Nablus in particular, I think what it's marked by is this growth or, or rise of these new groups. The one that gets the most play is Lion's Den, but it's really been uh, a growth of groups that are un un unattached to official leadership, to any unified leadership. It's really a sign of a younger generation in particular uh, are full of despair, who's decided that the Palestinian Authority does not represent them, that the Palestinian security forces are not able to protect them or uh, to resist the occupation the way that they would like, and so are taking up arms. And this is what you're seeing playing out in the West Bank with repercussions. You know, the Israeli uh, army feels that the Palestinian security forces do not have control. They, in fact, don't have control in those areas. So they are coming in. Um, you're seeing these firefights with large scale casualties and fatalities. And of course, we've been seeing uh, terrorist attacks also uh, uh, against Israelis. So this cliche term cycle of violence is certainly where we're at right now. Yeah, the the, the most dramatic cycle that actually managed to uh, to pierce uh, the, the global front page's preoccupation with Ukraine or here with American politics was what happened after the, uh, uh, the shooting deaths of two Israelis uh, on the West Bank, two settlers. Uh, the retaliation was uh, effectively a, a a Jewish settler pogrom of a, of a Palestinian uh, town. Absolutely. And it was striking to hear that term very accurately used by Israeli officials and military officials to uh, what you're describing. Um, it was there was a, a terror attack, a shooting of two brothers, uh, Hillel and Yagel Yaniv. Um, and then, as you said, uh, a, a group of extremist violent settlers went rampaging through, conducting a pogrom in this town where this happened, uh, killed one, Sameh Akhtash, uh, several injured and cars burned, properties destroyed. Uh, really, the likes, this is where I think we're starting to see, I think we can use the term unprecedented, okay. um, this kind of uh, retributive um, you know, extremist retaliation from certain pockets of, of, the, of the settler community. These these new groups that you that you speak you mentioned lions then as one yeah. of them just a, a the, the name suggests more of a, of a gang than a, than a political movement actually I mean it it used to be one thought of the the armed groups that were part of Fatah Al Aqsa Martyrs Brigade yeah. and other groups that were Islamist and that were related to Hamas or Palestine mm -hmm. Islamic Jihad that was backed by Iran or something are these groups do they have a, a some ideological flavor to them, or or are they sponsored by 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 larger actors in the region? What do we know about them? I mean, what you're certainly seeing, and I actually think you're seeing some of these these larger actors that you're mentioning: Palestinian Islamic Jihad, even Hamas now getting in the game, and Alak Samata's brigade associated uh, with Fatah. You're definitely seeing uh, you're seeing some of these individuals. Uh, who will express affiliation or ideological affiliation with those groups. I think you're seeing some of those groups trying to co-opt the moment, I would even say, um, mm -hmm. and, and claim that mantle of resistance that has really been taken up by what I think initially started as uh, young individuals who felt very disaffected mm -hmm. uh, by these groups that had dominated the scene before. Um, I think what's actually interesting about what you're seeing here is you're seeing some strange bedfellows. You're seeing uh, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad affiliated fighters uh, finding common cause and fighting alongside al Samata Brigade, Fatah fighters, groups, and, and Hamas even. This is, it's, there's a unifying component to the resistance Distance here. And again, I think we have to look at the generational component. Uh, these are 
young men uh, primarily. And what we know from consistent polling and just from what we've seen, those who have spent time on the ground, the attitudes of that younger generation um, a feeling that uh, they're at a point of desperation, they have nothing to lose, they have leaders who do not represent them, and that it's that they, they need to take matters into mm-hmm. their own hands. Explain uh, to someone who hasn't been uh, following this closely, where does the increasing violence on the West Bank, excuse me, <clears throat> where does it, if it does, where does it intersect with the controversy over the ju- judicial reform uh, bill in, in Israel? Uh, what's What's the connection between the two? So that's a, that's a complex question in the sense that um, I think there are many ways to answer that question. Uh, I think that one of the interesting things David was talking about the protests and who's been showing up at the protests and who hasn't been showing up at the protests. There as is, as David mentioned, and you both discussed in this previous segment, uh, a fascinating ideological diversity of those who are out on the streets protesting the uh, the proposed judicial reforms in Israel, those from right, those from left, uh, center. In the early days of the protests, some of you might recall that uh, strikingly, I think the first time there was a large scale gathering, there was a point where uh, there were protesters who showed up uh, with a Palestinian flag and who were sort of protesting, were very much in mind with a, with a sort of more uh, left-wing pro-Palestinian right, rights uh, perspective. And the organizers of the protest basically said, you need to take that flag down. If we want to have unity of uh, purpose on this protest, we cannot bring the Palestinian issue into it, right? The idea that this is the, the issue, and we saw this with the prior government, the government that preceded Netanyahu. If we remember, we had a very broad and unprecedentedly broad ideological and political sweep in that coalition. And the way they held together for as long as they did is to make sure that they only dealt with issues around which they could find consensus. And they knew that one issue around which they would never find consensus was with how to handle uh, the Palestinian issue, the occupation in the West Bank. Um, And so I think that the question you asked to David of why aren't we seeing Arab citizens in the streets of the protests, I think if you ask many Arab citizens, that's a matter of concern for them. Mm. They feel that uh, concern for democracy stops their mind. They would say that the ongoing occupation is fully connected to democracy uh, in Israel. There are those in Israel that say the Palestinian issue is a security issue, and that is separate from what we're looking at when we look at the freight of democracy. But the other piece that David mentioned that's relevant to your to your question is remember in this coalition and very much pushing for these legal reforms are those with an interest of expanding the Israeli footprint in the West Bank. But Salah Smotrich, Itamar Ben Gvir, these are both people who would like to see annexation, who would like to see uh, Israeli control over the full sweep of the West Bank, and who, let's also uh, take note of the fact, are both in senior positions of control over the security situation in the West Bank, which uh, has been a, a particularly um, provocative ingredient, I would say, added to this, right? These are these mm-hmm. are two men who are known uh, to be on record being uh, incredibly, it's being convicted of incitement, um, racist statements, very um, a clear view of, let's, let's also recall that Betzela Smotrich the other day um, caused rightfully so great uh, international pushback and condemnation when he suggested that Hawara, after this program that you mentioned, should yeah. be, I think the words were wiped out. So uh, you cannot disconnect what is happening on the domestic Israeli scene, I think, from the reactions and the um, the sentiments that you're seeing also in the West Bank. Just, just a last question for you, Lucy. There was a great deal of criticism of, uh, of Smotrich for for uh, saying Hawara, this, the scene of this of this. Uh, Ogram, uh, uh, it should the whole place should be wiped out, which I think he then, in some way, tried to claimed that it, it tried to back away from. But uh, there were no consequences for what happened at at Hawara or this this mounting violence on the West Bank. I mean, the U.S. has criticized that behavior and suggested there should be accountability. But um, do we expect that the people who who committed the violence will actually be tried uh, for what they did? Well, I think that one thing that that, that many uh, analysts have been commenting on is what happened in the wake of the uh, of of the the pogrom in Hawara. There were arrests. There were then some people released, and there were some that pointed out that the reaction uh, was very different than you might see, or distinct in how uh, the Israeli authorities 
handle arrests after there's been sort of Palestinian perpetrators. Um, I don't know. I'm not following closely the uh, mm-hmm. how this is playing out legally or where that where where that uh, process is right now in the wake of what happened in Hawara. We have seen since the attack we've been talking about. We've seen a couple of other incursions and attacks also on Hawara and elsewhere. And I, I think, uh, you know, this also, this was a particularly uh, pronounced one, but over the last couple of years, this phenomenon of extremist, radical, violent settlers. And again, obviously, this is not a group that represents all of the settler community, mm-hmm. but this particular brand um, of, uh, of a violent extremist settler, uh, these kind of attacks are not um, there, there, there is a fairly been this fairly consistent beat over a couple of years um, of attacks on uh, Palestinians on their farmland, attacks on oh. olive trees on their farmland, and so the question is, will this what happened in Hawara be so dramatic that it uh, might start to turn uh, turn the tide on how seriously the Israeli authorities are taking this, um, and what that means for cracking down uh, on those uh, type of actors. Lucy Kurtz or Ellen Bogan, thanks. Stick around because we'll we'll be coming back to uh, all of you in just a moment. We're we're going to turn now to our third panelist, Martin Indyk. Uh, Martin Indyk has spent decades involved in U.S. Middle East diplomacy. Uh, He served twice as ambassador to Israel after having worked uh, in uh, Middle East issues at the National Security Council. At the State Department, he was assistant secretary for the region, and he was named by President Obama uh, to be a key member of uh, Secretary of State John Kerry's team that tried to negotiate an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. Uh, He is now a Lowy Distinguished Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City and the author of the book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Martin Indyk, uh, welcome. It's good to see you. Hi, Robert. Good to be with you. Let's start with what the United States uh, has done, could do, or should do about the turmoil in Israel. Should uh, should the United States government be siding with the protesters, or uh, should uh, your successor ambassador be uh, conveying uh, strong messages to the prime minister? What, what what should we be doing now? Well, I think the basic point is that that this is an assault on Israel's democracy, an attempt, as uh, David has described it to undermine the independence of the judiciary, which is the only uh, effective uh, check and balance uh, on the government. Uh, And because United States support for Israel, which is deep and broad across uh, American society, depends not just on common interests, but on common values of identification with Israel as a as a democracy uh, surrounded uh, by autocracies, uh, what President Biden defines as the def- you know as the defining issue of our times, the battle of democracy versus autocracy, Israel is seen very much as on the front line of that. And and if its democracy is going to be undermined, uh, then it does affect the common values between the United States and Israel. So it goes fundamentally to the relationship. I just want to pursue this notion that it it would undermine democracy. I remember being shocked when I uh, went to to live and work in London uh, that when the House of Commons passed, say, a budget, uh, that was law. I mean, the 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 House of Lords could get involved in a very small number of issues, and the royal assent was was meaningless. They had a parliament that was elected, and they they passed laws. Is is the issue constitutional here, or is it? That one side, uh, that that there's such such differences between the two sides, uh, that uh, uh, giving all power to the majority in the Knesset uh, is is a, a, a political affront to the kind of folks we see protesting from Tel Aviv. Well, majority rule is a basic principle of yes. democracy in Israel as much as it is in the United States, where the majority rules, but it does not rule without respect for minority rights. Uh, is critical to the democratic process. And the Supreme Court in Israel plays that role of protecting Mm -hmm. minority rights. And its independence is under assault here with this judicial revolution that the government is trying to pursue. And that raises questions about, about the, as I said before, the common values that underpin the US-Israel relationship. 
The uh, I think to, to many uh, observers, certainly to me, uh, the most dramatic protest imaginable uh, is that of the military reservists. And uh, I mean, pi pilots who who were refused to fly the prime minister and his wife to Rome later this week to meet uh, with with the prime minister there, and uh, who aren't showing up for their uh, for their reserve duty. Um, sometimes members of, of a very a, a very elite. Uh, units. Can, can you explain what's of special importance uh, to people in uniform in Israel uh, of having an independent judiciary? Well, I think it is this general sense that that Israel's democratic institutions, or one of them, the Supreme Court, is is under assault. That will uh, change the nature of of Israel's democracy in a very fundamental way. That will be heading towards a, a Hungarian type of illiberal democracy um, that has people we've you've already discussed it across yes. the spectrum up in arms. I mean but as as you've explained it to me, uh people in the military are protected uh from say the International Criminal Court, so long mm -hmm. as Israel's courts are regarded as as independent and uh and, and fair if if uh if the Israeli judiciary were considered to simply be an instrument of, of political authority, then Israeli uh, officers would be more liable to uh, to be charged with war crimes uh, uh, in, in that case. Do I have that that right? Yes, indeed. And, and it is a, a concern that has been expressed behind closed doors, although leaked to the press, uh, by the, the highest uh, uh, army generals uh, who do have this very real concern about uh, the way in which the independence of Israel's judiciary has served as a shield against uh, prosecution on uh, charges of war crimes um, in the use of force by the Israeli army uh, at the International Criminal Court of the International Court of Justice. And, and uh, that is a very real concern because uh, Israel's judiciary is highly respected around the world um, for its independence and for the wisdom of its judges. And, and if, if that is no longer the case, then uh, the International Criminal Court, for example, which does not and cannot intervene in cases where there is an active independent judiciary, such as Israel's is today, that gives a shield uh, against these essentially unjust prosecutions that will be mounted against uh, Israel's use of force. Uh, so it's another reason to be concerned about what's happening here. Um, if, if if I were a uh, a, a, a cynical a supporter of the government uh, in Israel, I would say uh, I hear the Americans and a lot of the Europeans are very upset about what they're seeing going on in Israel right now. But after a while, they always forget about these things, and uh, life life gets back to normal. And uh, you know, there's there's a shooting of an American journalist on the West Bank. It's it's a big deal for for a week, and then it's in the back pages, and people forget about it. Uh, um, there were big joint military operations with Iran recently, certainly suggesting that the relationship with Israel is is uh, quite strong. Um, would I be right in saying uh, there really aren't any any strong international consequences to what we're doing here? Well, I think it's it's hard to say. One one would have to note that just as the the uh, revolt of civil society in Israel is unprecedented. Yeah. As David and Lucy have suggested, the reaction in the United States is also uh, unprecedented. I mean, it's unusual to see Mike Bloomberg, Mayor Mike, uh, writing a an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, critical of Israel. Tom Friedman has <laughs> now written five in a row <laughs> yes. uh, articles on this. Uh, and that's that's because he knows his readers are very concerned about it, that, that in the Jewish community there is growing concern and, and, and it's being expressed 
uh, in all sorts of different ways uh, because people who have normally been reticent about criticizing Israel now fear that the direction Israel is headed in is, is going to really tear apart not just Israeli society, but the U.S.-Israel relationship and the Jewish community in the United States. It's, it's not uh, all that rare now to read a story in which uh, some Israeli is quoted as saying, uh, we're on the brink of civil war, or uh, I fear a civil war. Is that hyperbole? Is that, are you, would, would, you, would you say that's uh, something to be concerned about right now? I think it is something to be concerned about. Uh, I wouldn't exaggerate it, but one can imagine the following scenario. Uh, that the the judicial uh, changes take place, the legislation is moving forward, and uh, it's clear that there's no intention, at least for the time being, to to hold it up. Uh, and and if those laws are passed, then it seems to be likely that the Supreme Court will knock them down, and then we will have a full fledged constitutional crisis, even though there's no constitution. Uh, and that can lead to violence. Uh, one remembers back in the days of the of the Peace Now movement in which a hand grenade was thrown into to the crowd. One remembers the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, violence uh, could well occur in these circumstances of high emotions and, and confrontation. Uh, so I, 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 civil war is perhaps too strong a word, but the, the potential for violence is very much there, I fear. Uh, you, the, the, you, you've uh, actually managed to find uh, uh, some something to be optimistic about, and at least in the protests that are taking place in mm -hmm. Israel. Uh, that uh, And it, it, it does relate to the fact that uh, these do not address the issue of the relationship with the Palestinians in the West Bank, these, these protests. Uh, so you, do you think it's possible that a new, a new center is being found uh, in Israel? It would ultimately have to address the, the issues of the Palestinians in some way, but, um, but it might have a better chance of coming together by not doing so right now. Yeah, I do think this may be the silver lining in what is a very dire and, and disturbing uh, situation, uh, that the peace movement in Israel was essentially eviscerated uh, after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin by the Intifada, the thousands of Israelis and Palestinians that were killed over five years of horrendous violence, and, and all, all trust was destroyed between Israelis and Palestinians, and, and the, the peace movement in Israel essentially disappeared. And as Lucy said before, it became impossible even to talk about the Palestinians in, in election campaigns, uh, that the left was painted as, you know, traitors and yeah. Arab lovers and, and so on. Uh, and you see what's happened to the Labour Party and Meretz. They've all but disappeared. Now we have a, a uh, broad and strong social movement arising in the center of Israeli politics, center left and center right coming together, not to promote peace, but to, to protect democracy. And that is a cause which is resonating. Uh, if, and we still haven't seen it yet, but if the political leaders of the center, uh, Gantz and, and Lapid in particular, are able to uh, ride this tiger uh, to a uh, into a political direction that manifests itself at the polls, and we already see in the public opinion polls that that Likud is falling quite dramatically, and and the centre is rising. If that translates into votes at the ballot box at the next election, we could well see the centre taking power in its own right and undoing the laws that may well be passed uh, during this period. 
Ambassador Martin Indyk, thank you very much. Stay with us. I'd like to bring back David Makovsky and Lucy uh, Kurtzer Ellenbogen uh, so that everybody uh, can be here. And first, uh, I'd just like to hear very, you know, briefly from each of you, uh, or certainly from David and Lucy, what, what you've heard from the others and what you'd like to comment on from your fellow panelists. Uh, David Makovsky, some uh, some additional I, remarks? I think we're, like the three of us are in basic agreement. I, I don't see any uh, fundamental um, differences. I mean, you know, what Martin said about shared values, uh, that's been at the heart uh, of the U.S. Israel relationship. That's what I think attracted people like Harry Truman, uh, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, and uh, virtually every American president. Uh, the, the, the genius of, of the U.S. Israel relationship was when asked, is it shared interests or shared values? The answer was yes, uh, it was both. And to to hurt one of these two, you know, pillars is is the is, is the most counterproductive thing anyone could do who really cares about this vibrant relationship that has gone with all its, uh, you know, policy differences has gone really from strength to strength. It's it's deepened dramatically uh, as we look over these 75 years. So. You know, I think, you know, I, I very much identify with what Martin said. I also identify with what Lucy said. I mean, look, in a certain way, we're looking at a, a black swan moment of history. If this doesn't if this doesn't reverse course, we're seeing a situation where due to maybe a, a trial of the, of the prime minister and, and you could say a boycott, no doubt, of the center and left, you know, he goes with a hard right group. And that leads to this uh, destabilization, almost. Uh, you know, with, with with the with the judicial. Uh, I don't call it reform. I call it, you know, it, it's it's at least an overhaul, if not a revolution. Um, you know, that really rips at the social fabric, and it does what Lucy says, which is it, it leads to a radicalization in the West Bank. Uh, this uh, hard right government. Uh, and then, God forbid, there'll be also terrorism inside Israel. I mean, it'll just keep spiraling. Yep. It, it's it's a moment of where, like a domino moment that I, I feel uh, very greatly. It's a black swan moment. And, you know, I hope that they stop before the break. You know, we didn't really get into this yet. There's all sorts of compromise proposals out there. I saw just before we went on the air that Smotrich uh, wrote a Facebook post for the first time in a really long letter to the Israeli pilot saying what I said about Huwara really damaged uh, your maybe your trust in the military. Now, it, it did more than that, too, but that's a yeah. whole conversation. But I'm just I'm just worried that this what I called in my remarks, Robert, the the difference between a, a kind of a right of center government that that might have, you know, been maybe conservative, right? but not radical right. This is something different. And it's playing out in two different arenas, all in a negative way. And I just hope and pray that there's a pullback. We haven't really, I mean, I think Lucy referred to it, but, you know, with yeah. Ramadan and Pesach coming up, converging for the third year in a row, you know, you've had the Intel people meeting. There was a meeting in Aqaba. I think there's supposed to be a second meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh, which might not have been announced yet, uh, before Ramadan. But it had a public side that every all the intelligence agencies, Israel, the PA, Jordan, Egypt, the United States, all thought, let's put a lid on this. Let's stabilize the situation. But it's hard to do that when uh, you've got all these dynamics going on. Yeah. And it's it's not all on Israel either. I want to be very clear about that, that, you know, what's what's, you know, the, the, the PA has lost a grip in Janine, yeah. in Nablus. And that's also a part of it. We have a time to go into it. But I think we all, I don't know, I think we're all three of us are no, all pretty much on the same page. Lucy Kurtzer, uh, Ellen Bogan, you have some some comments you'd like to make on what you've heard from your fellow panelists? Yeah, I'd just say a couple of additional things. I think David's description of it as a black swan moment uh, is exactly right. And maybe you mentioned to, to Martin this notion that maybe there's a silver lining. It's hard. I think we all grasp at a time that's so desperate for a silver lining. And, and maybe, sadly, that silver lining becomes, has it gotten so dramatic that mm -hmm. it's going to force people to make decisions uh, that they put off making that can that can can 
turn things around and start addressing dry, conflict drivers that I think have lain unaddressed for a long time um, that have led to this moment. And those are internal conflict drivers on the domestic political front, but also, of course, conflict drivers that relate to the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians. Israel often talks about being prepared for a multi-front war, and that's often referred to right when we're looking at threats on, Gaza, on the Gaza border, we're looking at threats uh, in the north with Hezbollah, we're looking at threats to the east. And here, I think what you're seeing right now is almost, you could look at certainly an active uh, dual front battle in some ways. You've got, you've got what's happening uh, in the West Bank. Gaza, we haven't actually talked about. It's been relatively quiet until now, mm. uh, again, in relative terms. But if we see what's going on internally in Israel as a front of sorts, um, this is really stretching um, uh, Israel in a number of ways. Um, and, and I think that uh, even the, you hear the military language, you Martin referenced uh, people like Gantz and I think Eisenkart as well, talking about how the court uh, has been a shield in many ways. As per, and and I, I think Eisen, I think it was Eisenhower who actually used the term, it's been our legal iron dome. You can hear the sort of the, the military, the security yeah. language being used around this. I mean, I, I think this is a moment of reckoning that is not... Um, the, the, that is not passing. These uh, are you're referring to to Israeli chief of staff and yeah, and, uh, exactly. and Benny Gantz, well, of course, the former uh, yes. defense minister as 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 well. Um, uh, a question that was submitted earlier, David Makovsky, uh, what is the impact of American billionaires providing funding over uh, ten years to create new Israeli think tanks such as uh, the Kohelet Forum, uh, which has uh, upended Israeli uh, Israeli civil uh, civic society? Uh, the um, and resulted in the so-called judicial reform politics in Israel today. Uh, have have the American billionaires been extremely influential, David? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it, it has true. I mean, I I found it a bit surprising. The prime minister talked about foreign funding of the of the demonstrators when it's clear that you've had an incredible outpouring from most, if not all, uh, segments of Israeli society, but. You know, Kohelet is, a, you know, you've had these two billionaires, it seems like, in Philadelphia, uh, who, you know, who, would, who, who have, it seems like have a, a, you know, libertarian agenda in certain areas. It's unclear how libertarianism plays out in this context. But, uh, and they have provided some of the intellectual infrastructure, not just here, but in other, the, the, the nationalities law, they were key. They, they basically are assuming that politicians are very busy people. They don't have time to, or maybe in certain cases, even the capacity to write bills. If there's a think tank that could write the whole bill for them, you know, then I think that that helps uh, some of these causes. To be fair to two people who I disagree with, of course, pretty strongly, uh, Yariv Levine and uh, Simcha Rothman, this has been a personal I, I, preoccupation, obsession, depending on your views, for a long time. So I don't think Kohelet was able to impose an agenda on people, but I think it took people who wanted to go this way and provided them with the with like some of the policy infrastructure in terms of that framework. And um, so I think that is definitely a, a piece of this. And uh, you know, I think I think it's a very good question. Martin, I'll just jump in, yes, Robert, on, yes, on this, because it, it's interesting. I think people will be just to know that this Kohelet think tank, which is behind the the drafting of the legislation that's causing such a problem, uh, its senior economic analyst today wrote a piece uh, criticising the legislation and expressing deep concern about the effect it will have on Israel's economy. So even within the think tank that is uh, producing this, uh, you've got dissent. Let, let's let's talk a little bit. I'll hear from from the others about the role of of, uh, of Isaac Herzog, whose father was also president of Israel. Yeah, you know the joke. They call him Herzog the Second. Herzog the Second, right? And his brother is is I think the the Israeli ambassador to the United States, right, Mike Herzog. Yeah. Uh, so this is and the the grandfather was the chief rabbi. So or was. Right. Uh, Ashkenazi chief rabbi, so it's a pretty illustrious family in uh, in Israel. Uh, I, th I thought that his original ideas, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, but his his original ideas about a compromise uh, were about um, uh, making it uh, needing more than 61 votes in the Knesset 
for the parliament to overrule a ruling of the uh, of, of the court so that you could you know once you get any problem down to a number uh you could bargain for some other number it would take two thirds or whatever whatever i don't know uh that didn't seem to be greeted very enthusiastically by by the uh, protesters uh, is does a program uh, does a a change like that actually have the possibility of, of of solving the crisis over the court reform bill or overall uh martin uh, potentially yes uh and i think it's important that that we have this effort to try to pull back from the brink and and reach a compromise and it in theory it should be possible uh it's about uh moderating uh the question of how many votes it would take to override uh, the Supreme Court judgment, uh, who has how many votes on the uh, committee to appoint judges, uh, whether the government has, has a majority there or, or is more constrained in that regard. Um, there are sensible solutions and, and a recognition that it wouldn't be such a bad idea to make some changes uh, in the way that, that the appointments are made or the court is able to intervene. Um, but uh, in a situation where emotions are running so high uh, and the street is is really um, worked up about it, um, the chances of actually uh, uh, being able to get a compromise that can can garner the support of, of a majority of people is going to be a real challenge. And it's not at all clear at this point that it's going to be possible. The leadership of the opposition, that is to say, uh, Yair Lapid and, and Benny Gantz, the centrist uh, leaders, are both insisting that before there can be any uh, consensus uh, compromise, there has to be a stop to the legislation. And uh, Levin and, and Rotman, the proponents, are pushing ahead with the legislation. Uh, so, so um, you know, Unless that there's a halt to that and attempt to really build a consensus, it's hard to see how these ideas that are uh, Bushy Hertog, the president is pushing, uh, can actually gain traction. I'm going to ask uh, all of you uh, now to to do the uh, the impossible, which is to, to report the future for a moment here. Uh, Martin, you raised this possibility. Shira Goldman, a uh, viewer, asks, how likely, that's my question, how likely is the possibility uh, that Israel could be heading toward a, a constitutional crisis in which the Knesset passes the bill stripping the Supreme Court's independence and the court itself declares their actions to be uh, illegitimate? Is that um, just uh, briefly, and uh, Martin, we can start with you as your, your picture is up right now. Uh, do you think that's a um, uh, a likely possibility right now? Yes, I think I said so. I do yeah. think it's uh, it it it's uh, if if there's no pulling back, and bear in mind the prime minister could intervene now and pull back. He would have done pull, so. Pull back on the not, bill, and yeah, yeah, uh, to put a pause and to call for for uh, uh, discussion about uh, compromises. Uh, the old Bibi Netanyahu would have done that. Yeah. The fact that he hasn't done it, at least not yet, suggests that he's beholden to the to his far-right partners in a, in a way that he, he certainly wasn't before when they weren't in the coalition. Uh, but if he doesn't pull back and, and if this proceeds, then there is a good chance that, that the Supreme Court could strike it down. We don't know that yet. Um, but if that ha happens, then you've got a full-fledged confrontation between the two branches of government, yeah. between the Lu judiciary and the Lu Knesset. Uh, Lucy, do you think that that uh, kind of crisis is is more likely than not? Uh, I do. I, I think Martin uh, said it clearly um, up front, and I think that the key here, again, we keep talking about Netanyahu and the old Netanyahu, and are we looking at the Netanyahu, you almost feel like he's looking for some deus ex machina here to come and save him from this, this mess that he's almost he's created for himself. Um, and the question is, which of his impulses will overtake? You know, I, it makes me think um, 
you know, I, I go back, I'm sorry to tie this again to the Israeli-Palestinian situation, but let's go back to when we think of, to um, when Netanyahu in 2020 was talking annexation. And nobody was quite sure if he was serious about doing it. And in that at that point, the deus ex machina came in the form of United Arab Emirates, yes, right? the letter yes. in the Israeli paper by Ambassador Tabor that set up the Abraham Accords, which we didn't get into. We'll have to come back for another conversation. But is there some moment like, is there some external factor here that Netanyahu is either waiting for, whether it's the centrist to say, we'll join a coalition and save you and, and, and agree to what you need on the legal front? I think that's the big question. That's the big question I have right now. Um, I do. I think he's looking to be saved from, from um, a mess of, of, of his own uh, making. And, and David uh, uh, Makovsky, with apologies for all the things we haven't gotten a chance to talk about. Yeah, look, I'll Durant. maybe end on a counterintuitive, hopeful note here. Okay. Uh, and I, I agree with what Lucy just said. I, I almost, and it, it's consistent with what Martin said, which is, look, if Bougie can't do the off-ramp. We should say Bougie is what people call Bougie, I'm sorry, president the president Isaac of Israel, Herzog. President Herzog. If he can't do the off ramp, it's what Martin said. It, 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 you know, it heads towards this kind of constitutional standoff, <clears throat> where I think it's very likely they 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 strike it all down, and it it could be that Netanyahu, you know, wants that because look, look here's a part that he doesn't have the public. If you look at the polls, only twenty four percent want him to ram this through without a significant compromise. There is no pro-reform, as they call it, no pro-overhaul um, uh, demonstrations at all. Uh, you've got Levin, Rothman. They all admitted they've over, they're ahead of their skis, that they they try to do a classic Israeli parliamentary thing, come in maximalistic, and then end in the middle. But if you start in the middle, you're, you're going to be much further over to the left than you would have liked. So... But what they didn't realize, this was a fundamentally different thing. Uh, when you play with the character of the state, people are going to think binary. They're going to think dictatorship, democracy. And so in a strange way, he knows, I think, from the people I talk to or, you know, who I feel are close to him, he knows he's lost. He's lost the public. And now the only question is, how do you get out of it? And he might not feel he can get out of it. And he might welcome the, the 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 Supreme Court as this Deus ex machina to say, okay, now let's talk. You know, so I, I don't know. I don't I would wish it didn't get to that. Yeah. You know, I think it's terrible, but I wouldn't rule it out. But what I do rule out, I think at this point, I maybe I'm uh, you know getting ahead of myself, but I do rule out that he's gonna be able that they're the coalition could pull this off. The public is just not there. The polling is showing us they're not there. Mm. So well, David Makovsky and uh, Lucy Kurtzer, Ellen Bogan, and Martin Indyk, thanks to all of you for taking part. And again, my apologies for all of the things we didn't get to uh, in this hour. Many thanks also to Joshua Plout, Roni Givigliano, uh, and Adrian Kiss from American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, which produces Global Connections. And also thanks to our technical director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, our program sponsor is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. It's a 501c3 national charitable organization, uh, which represents in the United States, Israel's largest hospital, a Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva, uh, in Greater Tel Aviv. The group's website is www.afrmc.org. I'm Robert Siegel, and this has been Global Connections Navigating the New Normal. Uh, see you next month. Stay healthy and stay safe. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.